This is Artful Discourse, your weekly escape into the vibrant world of creativity, culture, and intellectual exploration. I'm your host, Benjamin Kirk, and I invite you to join me on a journey through the rich tapestry of human thought and the beating heart of artistic expression at Fresno State's College of Arts and Humanities. Good morning and welcome. Today our guest is Dr. Honora Chapman, Dean of the College of Arts and Humanities. We'll hear about her background, why the humanities and the arts are important, part of our students' development, and what makes the College of Arts and Humanities at Fresno State special for our community. Dr. Chapman, welcome. Thank you, Ben. So let's start by walking through your education. Where did you go to high school and college? I went to high school in Southern California in Pasadena. It was a sm- it is a small all-girls Catholic high school named Mayfield Senior School. And it is set inside a house on uh, a large property that was donated to the Sisters of the Holy Child Jesus and for the purposes of setting up an all-girls high school. And I have to say it was a fantastic fantastic experience. Being in an all-girls setting allows you to be um, a thinker and a doer without worrying about anybody else. And I experienced in grammar school that there is a gender different, a gender difference in the way teachers um, handle students. And oftentimes a girl could raise her hand and not be called on because she wasn't in She wasn't suspected to be as good at math as the boy next to her. And so what I loved about high school was you could thrive in anything, in any discipline, and nobody thought it was strange. So a classroom full of girls taking calculus, a classroom full of girls taking physics, chemistry, all the sciences, computer science, anything, that is possible at my high school, whereas I knew from grammar school that I was not going to have the same response from my teachers. And that prepared me for the rest of my life as a professor to think about everyone in the room and to really wonder about the ones who don't have their voices heard, because I want to make sure everyone understands they belong in that room and we want to hear from them. Yeah. And and college? And college, I went up to Stanford for my undergrad and I loved it so much that I applied to the doctoral program in classics, the field that I majored in undergrad during my senior year and was admitted into the doctoral program out of undergrad. And that was very exciting. And I studied um, all the ancient literature, history, culture, archaeology, you name it, as an undergrad and a grad student at Stanford that was done in the Mediterranean region by people who spoke Greek and Latin. I also um, tried to learn Hebrew at one point um, and picked up plenty of modern languages to be able to do the scholarship as well. So classics is an old field in the sense that it's been around since um, antiquity, frankly, in terms of rhetoric and the study of language. And um, so it's been around for well over 2,000 years. And it's my understanding that you specifically focused on one person in history, Flavius Josephus. So who is Flavius Josephus and what drew you to study him? Great question. Thank you for asking. I had an amazing mentor, Sabina McCormick, who was uh, born in Germany and spirited out to live in Britain right when World War II was starting. She was half Jewish and she would have had a much different life if she had not escaped Germany in time. Raised in Britain as a a Jew, she went to Oxford and she never forgot her roots and became an amazing expert on late antiquity. And I just wanted to be as smart as Sabina was when I was an undergrad. She made all five of us in her Byzantine history class, two, two quarters of Byzantine history, want to get doctorates, which is extremely weird at Stanford. People at Stanford want to go on and get law degrees or go into investment banking or something. They don't want to get doctorates and become university professors. So this was unusually, she was that inspiring. 
when I was in grad school and hunting around for a topic, I thought I, I might actually work on Augustine and his reception of Virgil and other ancient classical authors. She said, Nora, one day in the hallway, have you thought of looking at Flavius Josephus? And I said, no, who's he? And I went to the classics library, sat down, started reading. I opened up the first volume and just said, oh my gosh, where's this been my whole life? And was completely mesmerized by the way he wrote the Greek from the perspective of a Jewish captive during the war against the Romans. He had been a priest and a general and then a captive slash slave. Then he was freed. And then he went on to go to Rome and write history. His books are among the best preserved from all of antiquity. And most people never read them in classics, just like I, right? Mm -hmm. I had never read Josephus. And so that's why I started reading. And so what time period are we talking about here? We're talking about the first century A.D., and he was born in 37 during the reign, the first year of Caligula, and he died around 100. So he saw the he saw the reign of Nero as an adult because he went to Rome to help free some priests as a young man, went back to Judea, and then saw the outbreak of the rebellion. He was chosen to be a general. He went up to Galilee to be a general. We know all of this from his autobiography, which is actually the first autobiography from antiquity that's extant. And no one reads it, but it's really important. And I have a sad theory, and it's shared by others, why classicists don't read Josephus, and it's because he's Jewish. And it gets slotted into a different category of, oh, well, that's weird religious study stuff, and we're not supposed to really do that because we're classicists, and we're supposed to care about pagan literature. But I don't think about the ancient world in terms of slotting texts and peoples and, and ideas based on what I will and won't study. I just want to learn it all. And that's why Josephus was so exciting. Are his writings focused on religion? They are. There is specifically, there is a text called the Against Appian, where he's responding to the scurrilous writings of a gentleman named Appian from Alexandria, Egypt, who wrote before him a book called The Wonders of Egypt. And he denigrated the Jews in that book. And Josephus is responding to that denigration of his people in a two-volume set called Against Appian, where he describes his religion. But he also has a 20-volume history called The Antiquities of the, of the Judean People. And that book, 20 volumes of ancient history from the creation of the world, according to the book of Genesis, all the way to the year 66 when the rebellion against Rome broke out. He covers all that history. He describes all the religious controversies. He's an amazing resource that's non-biblical, yet based on the Hebrew scriptures and then based upon other texts that fill in the gaps and allow him to get to his present day. Can you talk about your scholarly work centered around Josephus? What are your past contributions? What are you working on now? So what I decided to work on was the final of the four works that are extant of Josephus, the Jewish war. In antiquity, history was the most popular genre of writing. Why? Because back in even more ancient Greece, each city-state had people writing the history of that little place. Fast forward under the Romans with imperialism, that kind of atomized history really had died out really with Alexander the Great in the fourth century onward. With more imperialism comes a suppression of individual histories. Instead, larger history happens. He's part of a trajectory of historians who come from non-Greek and Roman parts of the world who want to tell the history of their people. And in his case, as an actor in the war against the Romans, he wrote a history of the war in seven books. I analyzed that in my dissertation specifically for the way he cast the war and the siege of Jerusalem that led to the destruction of the temple in the year 70 CE as a tragedy. And he's writing in Greek and he's borrowing from the Greek tragedians. And it is a magnificent piece of literature. It is also an absolutely essential piece of history for your understanding of the first century in Judea, which is, of course, the same place that Jesus of Nazareth came from. 
And this is why Josephus's works survived, because the early church decided that Josephus's works attested to the life and times of Jesus Christ, and therefore this was worth saving. And the key thing was that he mentions Jesus a couple times in his text, The Antiquities, and that's why these books survived today versus the many thousands of books that didn't survive from antiquity. He's an essential resource that is completely underread in my field of classics, and yet I think incredibly valuable for our understanding of Roman history, Jewish history, and even contemporary times with um, what we see in the Middle East. These are not new problems. Yeah. Now, I understand you started your teaching career at Stanford as our lecturer in classics from 1998 to 1999. And he went on to lecture at Santa Clara University, teaching history, English, religious studies, and classics. Then in 2002, you came to Fresno State as an assistant professor of classics and humanities. Why Fresno State? Well, the field of classics is quite small in terms of the number of people who work on any given university or college campus. And in the Western United States, we have nowhere near as many liberal arts colleges. Therefore, there are very few job openings in classics. When I applied to this job, there were well over 100 people applying to it for a generalist position, meaning you can teach Latin and Greek and everything else. And I was excited about it because I love teaching everything. And I felt so fortunate to get this job because there were very few, if any others, that year in 2001, 2002. I applied right after 9-11. And to get a tenure track job in that kind of market seemed so lucky. And I came to Fresno uh, for the campus visit in February, and I was struck by the beauty of the campus with all the trees. And most importantly, the first time I stepped in a classroom, the students were so eager to learn during my job talk, which was teaching them a class like a job talk. It was a combo. Right. And their questions were better than the questions posed by my students at Stanford and Santa Clara. And I thought, I'm going to have fun here with these students. Yeah. And I, I believe that to this day. What I love about Fresno State students is they are grounded in reality. They have overcome life's challenges, but they're also incredibly culturally savvy. And they have um, linguistic abilities that surpass um, many Americans. And they are eager to learn. I love our students. I love teaching them. And they really inform my scholarship through their questions. It then gets me thinking, well, what do other scholars say about this problem? So that's how teaching at Fresno State is so valuable. Not only the reward of teaching such gifted, um, really eager students, but on top of it, their questions help you proceed in your own work. And your family has history in the Valley, I understand. That's true. I was um, the family member who returned after no one had been here for a good 30 years when my great aunt had left Merced, the last of the residents of the Valley. Uh, my gram, who was her sister, grew up in Merced in a house built by my great-grandfather and great-grandmother. Um, he was an immigrant from Ireland, and they were pioneers in Merced in the very early 1870s. But on the other side of my father's family, his dad's family, his, my great grandmother on that side had relatives who came out here to farm wheat in the Hanford area. And then that's why they came across the United States, went to Petaluma and came down to Merced to do ranching because of that relative. So my family's been here since the 1860s, approximately. Wow. I, have, I have no definite dates, but they resided here all the way through. My father was born, uh, raised in the valley on Chowchilla Ranch, and went to school in Merced because the ranch, there were no schools um, near the ranch, and they had to drive up um, through El Nido into, into Merced to go to school when he didn't live at his his grandparents' houses in Merced, he would come in from the ranch with his brothers and 
he graduated from Merced High in 1939. I have a long history of coming up here with my dad um, to the valley to visit our relatives when I was little. And, and so I knew the valley really well from the back seat of a car. <laughs> and then the streets of Merced. I know the downtown because their house was at 431 18th Street, and we'd walk those streets as little kids. And I I have such fond memories, and I remember the people who lived here back then, my grandma and her sisters. They were such lovely human beings, so welcoming of everybody. Now, while at Fresno State, you became the coordinator of classics in the Department of Modern and Classical Languages and Literatures and served as the director of the Smith Camp Honors, I'm sorry, the Smith Camp Family Honors College for several years. Can you talk about that experience a little bit? Yes. So I started as coordinator of classics two years after I got here um, in 2004, and I remained coordinator all the way till the time that I became associate dean in January 2016. But in the meantime... I um, decided to try to become and was selected the director of the Smithkamp Family Honors College, succeeding the um, directorship of Stephen Rodemeyer, the longstanding, beloved tenure director, the founding, not the founder, Robert Ware was, but the first director admitting and advising students. And I loved it. It was five years and we had so much fun because I had all these fabulous students, 200 of them, and I really learned how the university worked all the way across campus because I was doing admissions, recruitment, admissions, and advising, and I learned every major across campus because the students come from every major, and then I learned all the people who support students around campus, and it really made me much more of a citizen of Fresno State and a supporter and advocate for the power of a Fresno State education because I believe what we do here is profoundly transformative. Smith Camp provides a four-year full tuition plus dorm room if you elect to live in the dorms um, for four years, and it is magnificently egalitarian, and I love that. Everyone has the exact same scholarship, and they get along, and they study together, and they help each other, and we did a lot of community service together. I'm most proud of the fact that with... Um, with students in a special political science class in honors, there was a great deal of work for the environment, uh, restoring the river through river cleanups in coordination with River Tree. They cleaned 17 tons of trash out of the river. We planted uh, 50 plus uh, oak trees along the riverbank. I even got help with that. Um, we did tons of new um, community service projects in my five years. And I was most proud of amping up study abroad because I know that when you study abroad, you grow exponentially in a short period of time. And we went from about um, 10 to 15 percent um, participation in study abroad uh, of the 200 to about 85 percent over the course oh, wow. of my five years because I incentivized it. I found a way to make it appealing. And um, and then I led the first study abroad trip for SMIC camp to Rome with 24 students. Not all not all in honors. It was mixed with, you know, non honor students. Mm -hmm. And yet that was fabulous in 2012. And um, since then, I've had the privilege of doing um, Greece with um, the Eastons in 2015 uh, and Florence in 2016 on my own and also Mallorca in 2019, right before the pandemic struck the following spring. And so doing these trips allowed me to ex share other cultures with our students, but it started in Smith Camp and I think that was really important. And finally, scholarship. During my five years, I worked with associate deans in every school and college on campus and got honors programs established across the entire campus. And that I'm very proud of because I know that research is extremely important for the intellectual growth of all of our students. And, um, and so I really felt happy with what I did in those five years, and I needed to do my scholarship. I needed a sabbatical very badly to finish a book with a yeah. colleague in Ireland, and that's why I stepped away. All right. And then in 2016, you became Associate Dean of the College of Arts and Humanities and served as Interim Dean 
in 2019 and appointed dean in 2021. That's a, that's a mouthful, but that's, <laughs> <laughs> all right. And so what is special about the College of Arts and Humanities? I think the College of Arts and Humanities has this tremendous creative energy. You feel it in the room when our faculty assemble and you see it in what they produce as artists and humanists. It, profoundly gifted people in producing art, sharing it with the community, and also digging deep into ideas and researching things and writing important pieces of scholarship. And that I'm really proud of what we do in our college because our workload is high. There is no doubt about it. 12 WTUs of teaching is a lot. And yet our professors, our largest faculty on campus in terms of tenure track professors hovering around 130 plus tenure track, we really are strong in our creative, uh, our research and creative activities. Look at our Fulbright scholars. Yeah. Look at Pulitzer Prize finalists. Look at U.S. Poet Laureate uh, Philip Levine. Look at what our professors achieve in their careers. And you see very hardworking people, which reflects our student body and our valley writ large. And I think that this environment is great for people because though it is a challenge in terms of workload, I think you're inspired to work hard and produce great things. And what is your favorite part about being Dean? I think it is learning about individual colleagues and students and what they dream of doing. What I get so excited about is hearing the story of an individual professor or student saying, I really need to go to this conference or I really need to go on this study abroad adventure. This is why. And it just excites me to see on an individual scale how these people's lives are changing because they had an idea and the College of Arts and Humanities can help them. And one of the things that makes it possible to help our professors and students and the staff as well who seek professional development is the generosity of our supporters. We have a tremendously dedicated advisory board called AHAB. We have people far and wide who donate to the College of Arts and Humanities and every dollar allows our students and professors and staff to fulfill their dreams of achieving the next level. And that is possible because of this tremendous commitment on the part of our supporters to donating to allow us to support these efforts. And I'm very proud of that history in the College of Arts and Humanities it goes way back decades. We're, we're building on the, we're standing on the shoulders of giants who, who set up this system of support for the college and really modeled it for the rest of the campus. And I'm, I'm proud of the fact that we continue to achieve um, great success on Day of Giving, that we have tremendous generosity towards the Armenian Studies Program with countless scholarships that support students across the campus in all majors taking Armenian Studies. These are the things that really make us distinctive and spirited because that kind of support, it sort of, it, it seeps into your psyche. You know there's someone behind you. You may not even see them. You may never meet them, but you know someone's got your back. And that is profoundly comforting when you find yourself struggling because you're working hard. And our professors and students know that not only the campus, not only their professors, but even the community and those past supporters who set up endowments are there for them. And it's, it's really amazing when you see how these funds that are raised have a direct impact on students' lives and what they're able to accomplish through their education. Absolutely. Uh, you, you take the example of one artist who needed materials for these incredibly grandiose, extraordinary Mayan sculptures that she did. Those required materials. She did not have the money for the materials. Our Dean's Council allowed her to buy the materials to complete her artworks for her graduate thesis. 
that is the direct impact of people's generosity. Another graduate student actually in art um, needed to go to Copenhagen this winter to do research on these tiny, uh, this tiny figurine called a Harvey figurine of a Valkyrie supposedly. And she has her own theory about what exactly this tiny figurine is. And there she was debating with the museum director in Copenhagen at the National Museum about this figurine, and he was seeing it through new eyes, thanks to her. This is the power of Dean's Council generosity to fund trips, to make it possible for our students, faculty, to go places and um, further their own research, and further their creativity, too, when they go do photography in India or um, whatever they might do. All right, I'm going to challenge you a little bit here. Um, how are graduates of the College of Arts and Humanities relevant in the job market? What do they have to offer that, say, STEM majors lack? First of all, as the director of the Smith-Kent Family Honors College, I see all majors as valuable because okay. I really learned um, that everyone has something to contribute in a workplace after they graduate from Fresno State. However, I believe that artists and humanists bring a certain creativity and intellectual flexibility that is developed in our classes, in our studios, on our stages, in our concert hall that simply don't happen in other disciplines. And it's that same ability ability to immediately adjust in real time to a situation that the musician develops when looking at the conductor slow them down and the very moment in time while they're playing in their symphony orchestra. That is what the arts and humanities allow you to do in the workplace after you graduate. You can go into anything in arts and humanities, by the way. You don't have to major in business to become a business person. Right. All right. So why is the College of Arts and Humanities important to the local community and what kind of cultural enrichment is available to the general public? I know that our college is the single largest purveyor of arts entertainment in a very large radius around Fresno. We have wonderful arts organizations across campus, but nobody has the complexity we do. Right. And the number of offerings, when you think of our schedule, and Ben, you know this well from attending almost all of these events, we have way over 100 events. Music alone has over 150 events a year. It's insane how hard we work providing both artistic expression in the in the concert hall, on the stages, over in speech arts, uh, theater and dance, um, via our um, art design and art history department, through the exhibitions that they curate. Um, and in addition to that, we offer a plethora of lecture series through the humanists inviting fantastic, internationally renowned experts to speak to our students and community. And these are oftentimes the lecture, the lectures are free. So you can find more information about the college's public events at calendar.fresnostate.edu. Thank you, Dr. Chapman, for joining us this morning. We'll see you again next weekend for another edition of Artful Discourse. I'm Benjamin Kirk for the College of Arts and Humanities at Fresno State. Artful Discourse is a production of the College of Arts and Humanities at California State University, Fresno. The Dean is Dr. Honora Chapman, and the Associate Dean is Dr. Sergio Laporta. This program is written, directed, and produced by me, Benjamin Kirk, the College's Communication Specialist. The theme song for Artful Discourse is Made in Voyage by Fresno State music professor Benjamin Boone from his album, Joy. More information about his music can be found at benjaminboone.com. Special thanks to KFSR and FSR Underground General Manager Julie Lindahl for making this show possible. You can learn more about the College of Arts and Humanities and find an archive of our shows at our website, cah.fresnostate.edu, or on our blog, fresnostatecah.com.